And I'll just say that Terrence burst on my radar when he was a postdoc with um, Richard E. Bright, and I heard him talk about his amazing work about scrunching in transcription initiation. Terrence. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen now. And uh, in the interim, I will uh, not sing happy birthday to Evelyn Witkin, but I am delighted to be here and so thankful for this uh, opportunity and honor. Um, I haven't met you personally, Dr. Witkin, but I know that you took the time to answer a letter I um, transmitted to you via Joe Messing. Uh, in 2015, before your Alaska Prize, I visited Richard Ebright at Rutgers. We had a nice time. And when Yo Messing said, oh, I'm going to have lunch with Evelyn, I said, no, you're going to have lunch with Evelyn Witkin? And so I, um, I quickly wrote a letter which uh, described our work that, I'm gonna, that, that, that you've heard a bit about. And, uh, and then you very kindly wrote back a letter uh, with a, a number of uh, ideas and details that were not published in the literature for which uh, the students uh, throw themselves on this letter. It's a historical uh, memento. So thank you again. Um, can you see my screen? No? Okay. Uh, oh, wait, there we go. That's my fault. Okay. Now maybe you see my yes. screen? Yes. Yes. Good job. So thanks to thanks to Seth for an introduction. I'm going to be able to go through a lot of my slides very quickly. Um, and indeed, this is the fruit of an extensive collaboration over the years with Seth and, and Nigel Savory. Um, and it's it's led us to some very new insights, which help explain the mechanism for how your protein MFD is a Janus particle. It does two things at the same time. It does repair, but it also drives mutagenesis by potentiating our loop formation in a co-transcriptional fashion. And we've really been blown out of the water by this observation. And I think it has important ramifications for chromosome topology, uh, gene regulation, um, and in general, the intersection interface between our loop formation and, and transcription. Um, so I'm just gonna start out by saying that the reason that MFD exists is probably because you gotta get rid of a stuck polymerase somehow. Um, RNA polymerase elongation complex is one of the most stable biological objects I've ever been in the presence of. It lasts for 10 to the six seconds. Um, and we've measured that, and we're going to publish that soon, I hope. So if a polymerase gets stuck, uh, or if it doesn't respect termination signals and ends up in random places on the genome, it can cause major problems for other molecular motors, and in particular, the replication machinery. And so we believe that MFD is an essential actor in, in the regulation of re, uh, replication, replicative stress, for instance. Um, you've heard about the role of MFD in removing these stalled RNA polymerases and recruiting repair factors. I'm going to detail some of those. And I'll, I'll try to convince you that uh, we have the mechanism for our loop formation and MFD uh, mediated mutagenesis. But indeed, misregulated transcription is a hazard, and that's why you need MFD. And we've uh, attacked this problem through the prism of single molecule experimentation. And these experiments are like little movies. So I don't really have much of a choice. I'm going to have to take you to some of these movies and the actors one by one so that we have a, a complete stage. Uh, we begin with the DNA, the substrate, which we can tether to a bead at one end and a glass surface at the other. There are multiple attachment points. And uh, the use of a, a pair of magnets above the sample, which sits atop a microscope, allows us to supercoil the DNA reversibly and to measure its extension versus supercoiling properties, you get these so-called hat curves, uh, which we love to take. We have no sense of style, so it looks like a hat to a physicist. But the slope is important. The slope is very constant, and it tells us what the uh, rate of formation of a supercoil is. It takes about 60 nanometers of DNA to form one of these loops, and that's because DNA is stiff. So that's the substrate. And we're going to use the substrate to follow uh, transcription by using it to measure in real time the size of the transcription bubble. The size of the transcription bubble is accessible through uh, the DNA linking number formalism, which um, we were taught in high school, um, but DNA having not been taught in high school when you were a student. The linking formalism you probably already know, we expect that polymerase will unwind DNA locally to form bubbles, lowering its twist locally, 
and that this will mathematically titrate in a positive supercoil to maintain constant the linking number pulling the bead down by 60 nanometers, a huge distance, given that these enzymes are acting on only a few nanometers or angstroms of polymer material, we get 60 nanometer signals if RNA polymerase unwinds 10 base pairs of DNA. And with Richard, um, we had a great time uh, during um, my postdoc. I, I did not have the pleasure of being Richard's postdoc, um, but he was one of my uh, great mentors when I was at Cold Spring Harbor following again in Evelyn Witkin's footsteps, I hope. Um, so this uh, is a real-time experiment showing transcription. Um, the uh, DNA extension is now shown in real time. It's the Y data with the green points being the real time and the red points being one second averaging. And what you see is what Richard called the electrocardiogram of RNA polymerase. Each black bar highlights a pulse of transcription, which is the work of a single RNA polymerase. And there's three successive RNA polymerases that come in one after the other to transcribe our small gene that's on this DNA. And you can see little shoulder, um, whoops, corresponding to open promoter formation, RPO, scrunching, the doubling in the size of the transcription bubble. So in the open promoter, the bubble is 12 bases. It expands to 25 bases at initial transcription as polymerase attempts to escape, but cannot always succeed. It succeeds stochastically, and that's this increase in extension um, that, that follows the formation of the stressed intermediate. Um, and if I remember correctly, I have annotation marks I can show you here. Ah, oh, yes. Um, oh, but it went back. Okay, never mind. Um, so this is transcription with initiation, scrunching, escape, the elongation phase with a nine base bubble closer to the baseline and then transcription termination. So this is what normal transcription looks like. The polymerase arrives at the promoter, it unwinds it, it strains to escape, and once it escapes, it has a smaller bubble that accompanies it during elongation and transcription until bubble closure at termination. Now, if we take out the terminator, you never get the termination step and the DNA uh, remains in a low extension state with the transcription bubble stuck open. And that's what you see here in the left. So now we're going to actually stall the RNA polymerase at transcription, just after transcription start by withholding a nucleotide. And on the left, you see the pattern that we've described with the initial state, the scrunching and the initial transcription, initially transcribing complex, promoter escape, and formation of the RNA polymerase DNA elongation complex. Without MFD, this thing is stuck forever. With MFD on the right panel, you see release in two stages of the, of the elongation complex. Through the prism of this experiment, we see formation of inter, an intermediate. Now there's interesting kinetic details. We analyzed the time it takes to generate the intermediate. We analyzed the lifetime of the intermediate and we got really excited because the intermediate had a Gaussian lifetime. Could you imagine that? As single molecule people, we spend our time looking at single exponential chemical kinetics. It's boring. It's always a single exponential. Here, we had a grail, we had a Gaussian time distribution, which for us was very exciting because it meant there was something repetitive happening over and over again. Accumulation of steps causing this intermediate to have a long lifetime. But we couldn't know what was in the intermediate. Was it RNA polymerase? Was there MFD bending DNA? What was the state of the RNA polymerase if it was still there after having been violently remodeled like this? The bubble, the transcription bubble is massively remodeled here but what are the objects that are causing this? And mechanics can't tell us, we can't distinguish. So we had to do, uh, we had to build another microscope to answer this question. And so we built a microscope that couples the magnetic trap with single molecule fluorescence detection. And we made and purified the fluorescent proteins to do these experiments. The idea being the mechanical signal tells us what state the molecules are in mechanistically and in terms of catalysis. And the fluorescence will tell us who is present and who is absent. Um, in the different stages. And I'm gonna make a long story short, the RNA polymerase, as you've heard from Seth, is still present after having been remodeled by MFD. Um, here's the experiment. You have the, in red, the, the mechanical trace uh, uh, with the, with the uh, stalled elongation complex with the first vertical arrow and a little vignette showing the fluorescence of that first RNA polymerase that we had imaged at the same time um, by manually turning on the laser at that time. So this is literally the first experiment that worked here. And then we were really surprised because MFD in solution remodeled, it finished, uh, it, 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 it succeeded at remodeling the, 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 the elongation complex. And then we saw that the polymerase fluorescent signal in the second panel was still present, was even brighter, which meant this thing was moving after remodeling 
installed polymerase because a turf field gets brighter when you're closer to the surface. And then when everything was remodeled and the DNA was cleared of proteins, indeed, we saw no more evidence for any bound proteins on the DNA. And we repeated this experiment, checking for the RNA, checking for MFD. And, um, and what we found is that the RNA is lost. The polymerase is present in this intermediate state, but the RNA is lost and MFD is present, as Seth has, has, has said. Um, and so we had an inkling, as Seth has said, that this thing was after, it, that it uses translocation to push against polymerase and remove it, but then that something was still happening, that it wasn't, stopped, it wasn't done with its job. And what we did to see what happened next is, as, as Seth mentioned, we attached now the polymerase to a magnetic bead. We uh, stalled it by depriving it of nucleotides, and we added back ATP and MFD only. So now when we see the bead, it's telling us what the RNAP is doing. Um, as the RNAP is being manipulated by MFD. And indeed, this thing can transport the bead for two microns, which is 8,000 bases, actually. Processive motion of MFD, because there's only ATP here. Under the action of ATP hydrolysis, MFD is dragging the bead down over two entire microns. It's going slowly. It has a five base pair per second velocity. A tight binding for ATP, about 10 micromolar, very tight binding for ATP. And this processivity, it won't stop. It won't come off of DNA, except if you add UVRAB. So what we're seeing are the handoff processes. We can reconstruct step by step the handoff processes. I have to leave you with a cartoon at this stage. Um, we have the stalled RNAP. MFD displaces it and activates. And that's the orange MFD now in the third line. The activated MFD has removed the RNA polymerase. The RNA is lost. And this thing is slowly translocating, probably to cross over the lesion and deposit factors behind it. Now, UVRAB, I can't show you the data. We don't have enough time. But UVRAB actually intercept this translocating complex. They arrest it. And that's not a very popular word these days. So they'll release it rather than killing it. Um, they'll release the stalled RNAP, uh, the stalled uh, the, the MFD RNAP complex, and now we believe that we have a UVR A two B one complex that marks strand symmetry, that marks symmetry breaking, that marks the strand for repair, even if MFD and RNAP are gone. But that's an experiment that remains to be done, and we've prepared the fluorescent UVR A and the quenching UVR B that will allow us, we hope, to count how many UVR A and B are left behind after this, and indeed, is it a symmetry breaking complex? Now, that's all very well, but as you remember, there's another really, really, really fascinating task that MFD has been um, shown to do, which is induced mutagenesis via formation of R loops. And it took us a bit of probing and some people asking us questions before we finally took the courage to ask ourselves, now, what happens when RNA polymerase that is elongating? What happens if elongating RNA polymerase is intercepted by MFD because MFD doesn't know what the RNA polymerase is doing. There's no sign on the RNA polymerase that says we're stalled. In fact, from the outside world, it is not possible to distinguish a stalled from a transcribing RNAP. And there's no molecular radar, or is there? So James Portman joins the lab from Nigel Savory's group, having been trained in genetics and with extensive knowledge already in transcription and DNA repair. And he's very interested in understanding the basis for DNA mutagenesis for MFD mediated mutagenesis. And so James adds MFD to transcribing RNA polymerase. And he sees something that we've never seen before, which is that the bead gets dragged down to the surface in a matter of seconds. It stays close to the surface. And then like Christ on the cross, it resuscitates. And the DNA extension recovers its baseline. This is a, a nanometer scale object pulling a micron scale iron bead down over an entire micrometer. There's obviously something very energetic happening. And when we saw this, this really unusual pattern, this massive pattern, we were right away uh, uh, inspired by the work of um, uh, Liu and Wang and the twin domain model. The twin domain model says that if there's not free rotation of objects one around the other, for instance, if RNA polymerase with its RNA in the ribosome, the proteins being translated, they can't rotate freely around the DNA because of viscous drag. Then when the polymerase moves to the right, it's going to jam positive supercoils in front of it and create negative supercoils behind it. In the linking number formalism, it's because DNA length is being transferred from in front to behind, but no links are being given 
just length of base pairs, but no links, no topology. And therefore you can't form a double helix. And so behind it, you're denatured. So this is what's happening now. I up, we update the model from twins to triplets. We have tripartite topological domains with this partitioning of topology, positive supercoiling in front of MFD, uh, sorry, positive supercoiling in front of RNA polymerase, positive supercoiling behind MFD, but negatively supercoiled DNA, highly focused between MFD and RNA polymerase, answering a number of conundrums related to the twin domain model, which is the supercoiling can leak. Chromosomes are large. Why would the supercoils remain next to the polymerase? They shouldn't, they should dissipate away. And so that's been one of the questions of the twin domain model is what happens to the supercoiling? There are topoisomerases also that are going to remove it. Here, there's no space for a topoisomerase to come in. That initial domain is too small. And again, it focuses the energy of negative supercoiling into a tiny domain. And what we saw is that, so I, I've, I've taken a few shortcuts and I'm gonna to have to show you a bit more data again. The data I showed you originally was done on positively supercoiled DNA where the bead is just gonna go down because you accumulate positive supercoils in this little topological game. But if you do the experiment on negatively supercoiled DNA, you get a mirror effect where now the DNA extension rises as the positive supercoils forced in by the system, cancel the negative supercoils that we prepared the DNA with. The bead extension goes up to so the right-hand panel now, you see that the bead extension rises to four, and then it goes down four prime as you keep making supercoils in the little drawing. And then you see that it pops back up. It pops back up because of termination or because MFD fell off. And we have a high extension state now, which to us is very exciting because we've seen this one before. We know what it is, it's an R loop. It's an R loop state, that little shoulder in the upper right hand panel of that little time trace, I know is an R loop because I've seen it before in my graduate student days. Here's another example of it. Here it, 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 it stayed very long in that high extension state five. That's an R loop. Um, we know it's an R loop because uh, the lifetime of that state is highly sensitive to RNase H. Uh, it lasts 10,000 seconds if there's no RNase H. But if we add RNase H, it's gone in 10 seconds. Um, and indeed, this uh, little, little uh, domain of highly focused negative supercoiling is highly available to the RNA being synthesized by the polymerase to form a co-transcriptional R loop. And we believe indeed that is the mechanism for uh, MFD mediated R loop induced mutagenesis. The determinants for MFD that we've tested only two, but show that translocation is not necessary for this process. The MFD can be a translocase dead, but the fact of it binding to RNAP and then binding to DNA are what are enough to generate this closed topological domain. Again, MFD does not need to translocate. In fact, we can change the rate at which this domain forms by playing with the relative velocity of MFD and RNAP by changing nucleotide concentration. However, docking to polymerase is essential. If you have a docking mutant, it will never be able to form this triple domain. It will not be able to form a closed topological system and generate these negative supercoils. With um, Nigel, uh, James, Gwen, uh, and a couple of other students, uh, thanks to the strains produced um, in, by, by uh, Dr. Hastings, uh, who describes it in Wimberley et al. as some of the early work to try to get at the mechanisms behind MFD-induced, uh, behind, sorry, uh, 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 R-loop-induced mutagenesis. We confirm these determinants. So these, this is a lac revertin assay. It shows on the left that indeed the, the wild-type uh, bacteria that contains MFD will evolve adaptive response and, 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 and you'll see colonies uh, able to consume lac even though the lac gene was mutated. So they've, they've come up with a mutation that allows them to consume lac. Um, the wild type MFDs have a certain rate at which this can happen, 2000 colonies for 10 to the eight cells. But if you take out uh, RNAs H, this phenomenon gets much stronger again, because RNAs H is there to remove the R loops. Um, and if you, uh, and, but removing the RNAs H has no effect if MFD is not present. So the essentiality of RNAs H depends on MFD, it turns out. And the determinants that I described are confirmed on the right panel, where again, what we show is that the translocase dead uh, RA953 MFD is still capable of forming these R loops. So again, it's not dependent on translocation, but it is dependent on contacts with uh, RNAP and formation of this closed topological domain 
and the uh, LR499 mutant in green does not induce high levels of uh, R-loop-based mutagenesis. So indeed, the system just continues to astonish us. This is one of the best mechanistic explanations I've seen for how co-transcriptional R-loops may form. And it's your protein MFD, which is responsible for this. And we believe that the impact on human health and disease is going to be potentially important. Very exciting to hear that Seth and Ahura, uh, 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 the, the, the Darst and Merrick teams are teaming up. Um, because indeed, uh, uh, we're, we're really facing a James particle, uh, the, the determinants that allow it to do DNA repair or what allow it to do mutagenesis. Maybe it's highly conserved because of its ability to do mutagenesis. Maybe that's really the most profound reason for its wide conservation. Um, indeed, you're not, evolution is not going to get rid of you if you're a pro-evolution factor. Um, and, and we believe that what this suggests is that the docking site of MFD on RNAP beta subunit is probably an important target for drugs aiming to reduce antimicrobial resistance. But it's important to point out that we believe this phenomenon is important in humans, um, where the CSB ortholog of MFD has been implicated in chemo resistance and tumor evolution. And so we're currently actually exploring whether or not CSB is also driving R loop formation at the same time as it tries to do DNA repair. And so again, uh, Dr. Whitkin, thank you so much for having gifted <laughs> generations of researchers with exciting systems to continue to look at and happy birthday. And here are the students and the collaborators who worked on this. And thank you all for your time and attention.